Hello, everyone. Welcome to Iran 1400's Spotlighting an Author event. Today, we will be discussing Dr. Willem Flora's book, History of Hospitals in Iran, 550 to 1950. First, I'd like to take a minute to explain the project for those who may not be familiar with it. Uh, the Iran 1400 project is a project that exists to encourage healthy dialogue about the future of Iran. Rather than shouting and posturing, we encourage productive conversations. Uh, the project hopes to make a constructive contribution in regards to uh, communications and conversations about the future of Iran. And it aspires to better interpret Iran's past and present in order to more accurately perceive what Iranians themselves consider as a viable future for their country. Uh, today, we have with us Dr. Willem Flohr. Dr. Willem Flohr studied development, economics, and non-Western sociology, as well as Persian, Arabic, and Islamology from 1963 until 1967 at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He received his doctoral degree from the University of Leiden in 1971. And since 1983, Dr. Floor was employed by the World Bank as an energy specialist. However, after his retirement in 2002, he has dedicated his time to the study of the social and political history of Iran and has published extensively throughout this time. His books include, but are not limited to, Public Health in Qajar, Iran, Agricultural, Agriculture in Qajar, Iran, The History of Theater in Iran, a multitude of volumes on the Persian Gulf and a variety of translations. Before we begin, our communications director, Tabi Anvari, has some words for Dr. Floor. Thank you, Sydney. Dr. Floor, we are honored to have you, a veritable Iranologist which was a word that I had to learn. And of, of course, it aptly describes your body of work. Um, your work inspires and informs truly all of us. On behalf of the advisory board and the team at Iran 1400 Project, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today and look forward to gaining a deeper understanding on the subject at hand, benefiting from your research, analysis, and insights. We're delighted to have you, and once again, welcome. Thank you for those kind words, Tabby. Uh, before we begin with Dr. Flores' presentation, uh, I'll let y'all know in the audience that if you would like to ask a question, please do so either in the Zoom Q&A or by emailing your questions to media at iran1400.org. Uh, the format for today's event will be Dr. Floor presenting for around 30 minutes, followed by around 30 minutes for a Q&A. And without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Floor to our Spotlighting an Author event. He has a presentation that he is going to be reading off of, and I will be sharing my screen in order to... Uh, follow that presentation just one second let's see uh Martin, can you give me control just one second y'all there we go. As you all know, Zoom can be finicky. All right. Do you all see the screen? Perfect. All right. Is that good on your end, Dr. Floor? Yes, yes, I see it. You all right, perfect. To, uh, you, you can go begin. to the next one. Yes, perfect. Okay, let me start with the hospitals. Everybody knows, especially during this time of COVID, what a hospital is. It is a hospital, actually, a hospital. That's what we're going to explore in this uh, short talk. 
uh, you know, hospitals were a uh, recent invention, recent about 1400 years, 1400 years ago. May, that's not why it's called, the project is not called Iran 1400, by the way. Uh, before hospitals existed, people were treated at home or in the street by uh, traditional healers. And um, you had some type of treatment organizations, let's say for soldiers and for um, gladiators, but that was exceptional. Uh, also, the new hospitals were not yet an institution providing medical and surgical treatment, but, 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 but were basically, let's say, to care for people and provide them uh, not only with solace, but also with food in the bed. They were a charitable institution and uh, were not necessarily uh, for the local people. Next slide, please. Uh, the first hospitals, as we know them, were created in Byzantium at the, at the, in the fourth century when uh, Christianity uh, uh, increased in importance, helped by um, a, a downturn in the economy. And in order to attract uh, converts as well as to assist those who went on pilgrimage, uh, so-called Xenodogeon, uh, were um, uh, were created, which means it was a lodging for strangers, and um, it, it was a, a Christian institution whose function was to care for pilgrims, travelers, and the poor. Uh, it provided food, shelter, and care. However, there was no physician or nursing staff attached to it. The same church that was active in Byzantium also existed in Iran. And of course, the two were in contact. Uh, and um, they also started um, to um, uh, establish these Xenodogaeans later. Next slide, please. Um, th this uh, uh, forces me to go back in the history. If you read, let's say, the Encyclopedia of Islam or you go to Wikipedia, you will see that the first hospital in Iran was created in Gondeshapur by Shah Shapur. However, uh, research of the last 40 years have shown that the, uh, the sources that were used to make that argument were erroneous and are not borne out. Uh, in fact, an, an incru uh, let's say, if these things happened, they did not happen at the time uh, that uh, Shapur lived. Uh, and uh, for example, he was supposed to have uh, married a, a, a Byzantium princess that, that happened much later than, than, than he uh, existed, etc. But more important, in 550, the Shah Khosrow Anur Shirwan, after he had been ill and treated by uh, Christian physicians in, uh, to, order, uh, to show his appreciation, established a hospital. And the text in which this is mentioned is a text in Syriac um, by Timothy, the archbishop, um, to a friend. And very literally say that the Shah did it departing from custom. So clearly saying that the, the Sassanian Shahs had never, uh, had, uh, never uh, established a hospital before. Uh, the first hospital that we have some information of is in the foundation uh, document of the uh, Syrian Christian Theological Seminary of Nisibis, which is uh, in, 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 on the Iraqi-Turkey border, and though in those days part of the Persian Sasanian Empire. And it had indeed um, a, a Xenodogeon attached to the seminary, but very clearly the, the document state it was only for the staff and the students because they didn't want the students to go around uh, begging because the seminary itself depended on uh, handouts from the community. And so they, did, they didn't want the students competing with them. Uh, also, although uh, the uh, theological seminary uh, uh, offered uh, study in, in um, 
a medical text. It was not what we called nowadays call a major. It was something that if you were a, 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 a theological student that you that you do as a minor just for uh, for for your own personal personal interest. Uh, however, it is clear, let's say that, uh, and once again, I should stress. Uh, the information about the early hospitals and that goes down to the 19th century is rather limited. Uh, but we know, let's say, that um, uh, uh, one century later, in, uh, so uh, around in, in 550, um, uh, at least, let's say, uh, at Nisibis, the Greek sciences, because uh, medical sciences were the, part of the Greek sciences, were, were taught at Nisibis. Uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, we know that a, a Bimarastan, that was the literal translation of Xenodogion into uh, Persian, from Bimar, sick and stan, the place of, uh, in around 750. Um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, we know from letters that were written uh, that they say, well, I sent you another student to study at the Bimarastan. Or in another letter, there was, uh, it, uh, it's mentioned that there was a Ra'is Bimarastan, so a, a director or a chief of a hospital. But initially in the Gondishapur, but later uh, uh, quite a, a great um, fame, was like Nisibis, a, um, a theological seminary uh, with an infirm infirmary and nothing more. You could, you could again study uh, uh, medicine, but it was not uh, an important uh, thing. That changes around uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, um, uh, say, 790 or so, there's the 8th of the 8th century, when we see uh, uh, indications that there is actually um, uh, a possibility in uh, Gondeshapur and another school that you could study uh, um, medicine as, as a major. However, uh, what we also know are the famous um, uh, uh, physicians of the ninth century who were all Gondeshapuris, they had not been trained in Gondeshapur, although they came from there, they were trained in, in the family because it was medicine was a family business as many other crafts and arts uh, until recent times were. You were trained by your father or an other male relative. Uh, nevertheless, by 800, Gondeshapur had a great reputation as a center of medical learning where the best uh, um, physicians Work, for example, a, a very famous social commentator Adjo his uh, from Basra. He wrote that you know he saw a um, a Muslim uh, uh, physician couldn't get, get a real job. What what what's clear that he was not a Christian physician, and it was due because of it. not only because of non-Christian name, but he wore a white cotton robe instead of black silk and didn't speak the language of Gondish Shapur was was Syriac. Uh, and this is important because uh, what we see is that uh, uh, in Islam, the Galenic uh, Greek system was totally adopted without any change uh, and without any trouble. And that is, can be easily explained in the fact that uh, even let's say in the ninth century, the majority of physicians were still uh, uh, Christians. They gradually uh, converted and of course, they brought their knowledge with them and they thought there was nothing wrong uh, with their knowledge, nor was it in, um, inimical to their uh, Islamic belief, how shallow that may have been at it, uh, initially at the time. Next slide, please. Um, we hear again at 790 uh, that uh, Exenu de Geyen or Bimarastan was established in Ktesiphon, this is a town next to Baghdad, which by the Christian by the Christian Church, which is not surprising because most people were still Christian or Jewish in the, the um, Muslim in the uh, Muslim Empire, 
and uh, they continue to uh, make um, uh, charitable do donations. What's also interesting in all uh, Arabic sources, uh, even uh, later in, in medieval time, they never used the term Darumarda, which is the Arabic term for uh, the house of, of the sick. Uh, but Bimaristan, and, uh, uh, and, and which shows, let's say, that in the non-Iranian lands where uh, hospitals were created, they, they, that they were adopted from the Iranian uh, experience. This is also clear, not only from the Iranian experience, but from the Syriac experience, because when you, you find also that the director of the hospital was often called Saur, uh, which is not an Arabic or a Persian term, but a Syriac term. There were also, let's say, uh, by that uh, after, in, let's say, around 800 and later, um, uh, a, a number of hospitals were created in Baghdad by uh, a, a Muslim uh, donators, often Khalifs or, their, or family members. And one famous one um, is by the Wazir of um, Harun al-Rashid, Bar, uh, uh, Barmak, Yahya bin Barmaki, who came from Marv originally, where his family had been Buddhist priest. And uh, he established probably what is called the, the first Islamic uh, 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 hospital, although um, uh, it is often said that it was the Harun al-Rashid did, did, did that, but there is no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, the Islamic hospitals remained very limited in, in, in number. For example, in Baghdad, we, in the 9th and 10th century, we only know of, of five by name. Uh, but they were larger and better funded than the Christian Senate of Gion. And uh, initially, they were all, also not attached to a um, religious institution like uh, a seminary, which changes later. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, around uh, in the 10th century, the, uh, the, the caliphate loses importance. Uh, Persian dynasty, the Buyids take over. They establish uh, a lot of uh, quite well, we only know the names, we don't know nothing about them. A number of hospitals in various towns. Um, in one, of, in, they, uh, the, one of them, there were uh, a number of doctors attached and, and, and specialists. Um, it was said that in these hospitals, uh, doctors and staff of different religions worked together. Um, everybody was welcome, etc. Uh, the problem with, with that is that some people have said, yes, it is, it is like asking you now to write the history of Napoleon, uh, because it was written down 200 years later by um, two authors who, uh, who lived in Syria, uh, in Damascus, and um, who uh, basically only relied on written uh, and oral sources. However, I think, let's say, uh, it probably is true that between 900 and 1100, these modern hospitals where indeed uh, uh, care was given that was different from what happened before and afterwards, where you had specialists and where people tried to improve the understanding of medical science. Why do I think so? Because let's say um, in the uh, 11th century, a uh, local ruler in Gilan, which is in northern Iran, uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, a book, the Kabush Name, uh, to, to give uh, guidance to his son. And he, and he writes in the chapter on uh, medicine, he said that a physician must have, see, must have seen much service in hospitals, examined many patients and undertaken many treatments so that rare diseases shall present him with no difficulty and diseases of the internal organs be no mystery to him. They could almost have been said nowadays. I mean, uh, and here you have a man who was not a physician. Well, he, was a, he, he read a lot of books. He was a learned man. And, and I think that this um, indicates 
that um, there were indeed uh, uh, places where uh, uh, a, a modern form of medicine was practiced. Thank you. Next, place, next slide, please. Uh, the Seljuk came uh, about 100 years later uh, and took over uh, Iran, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, parts of Syria and, and eastern um, Turkey. And they again um, built hospitals in, in various, uh, various towns, although we only know their names if you don't know how, uh, uh, what type of medicine was taught and how me medicine was, was practiced. In fact, uh, one source said that the that there was not a hospital, there was a Daru Khane, which is basically a, a dispensary. Uh, it's interesting, at that time we see that uh, the hospitals, which were called often not Bimarastan any longer, but Dar al-Shafa, the House of Health, literally in Arabic, uh, were uh, part of a complex of a mosque, a Khanaga, which is basically a place for Sufis, uh, to, to worship a madrasa, a, a seminary, a bathhouse, and then you had the Dar al Shafa. It's also interesting that, uh, as I said, the period of modern medicine being practiced in hospitals lasted maybe between nine and 1100. That by that time, you see that the appreciation of how science should be developed and looked upon changed. It's not only, let's say, medical science, you see that it's particularly in, in, um, in theology, where in that century, the so-called Babel Itztahat, that is a, the gate to a free uh, jurisp uh, exegesis and jurisprudence of, of Islamic law was closed. You see the same thing happening with medical science. For example, um, one author in Nizam Arouzi um, in 1155, uh, furiously attacks those who even dare to question Aristotle and Ab Ibn Sina or Avicenna, as is said in the West. Whoever criticizes these, these two great men excludes himself from the array of men of wisdom, places himself among the ranks of idiots, and shows himself to be among the group of fools, which is totally different, let's say, from the time when Ibn Sina was practicing, who questions even Galen, his hero. Uh, next slide, please. The Ilkhans, uh, that was an offshoot of the Mongol conquerors, uh, also built uh, various uh, ho hospitals. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, about the hospital, about we know much or most actually, because we have the Dild Foundation document uh, in hands, um, which was built uh, at the um, around uh, 13, 1295, I think. I, I have the, right. It shows the word Bibarastan is not even uh, mentioned, it, uh, but uh, it's referred to as Darukhana, dispensary. Betel Atviye is basically literally the house of, of, of drugs. Uh, and uh, it was, let's say, the main function of that hospital was more that of a dispensary with ambulatory uh, patients only. Uh, there was also a Dar al Zaviya, uh, which is basically a hospice. But it's interesting, whereas the Darukhana, was for visitors, important visitors, because there was a ranking. There was a certain days for important visitors and the other days for the staff. But for the for people on the outside, they had this hospice and the, where they provide limited limited care. Uh, uh, there were no in no inpatients, so no beds, etc. Et Next slide, please. Uh, the the, oh, <laughs> 370 must be 1370, by the way. Uh, you get, let's say, then uh, Turkmen uh, uh, dynasties, the Timurids, uh, followed by the Kara and Akayunli. Uh, they again established hospitals, but we were part of a mosque in the Madrasa, but we have no idea how they functioned. We only have their names. We know, for example, from an Italian observer, of the hospital in Tabriz. He said it was more beautiful than a mosque and thousand people lived in there. But at the same time, he, he, the same author mentioned two other uh, 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 hospitals, in Shamahi, and, and, uh, which is in Northern Azerbaijan, and Mardin, which is in Anatolia. And he's, he doesn't mention sick people at all. 
and in fact notices that most of them empty and, uh, and a poor, miserable Darvishim on there. Next slide, please. Uh, also in the Safavids, uh, who, who reigned over Iran about 230 years, uh, the, the, hospital, the hospitals were part of the traditional complex. And, um, but again, we know nothing of what really happened there. The few descriptions that we have come from Europeans and who say that the only patients there were some, oh, uh, were, were let's say a, a Moribut Indian. One Persian source actually said there were only some madmen in there and medical care was limited in scope. It was only poor people and travelers. Uh, and in local parlance, people called it the Darul Marg or the house of death. This is a place where you shouldn't come. I come back to that later. Next, next slide, please. Then we get, uh, I go over, I forget about the 18th century and we don't, we don't know much about it. Uh, the sources are scarce. We come to the 19th century. We only know of three Dar al-Shafas in Iran, of which only one was off and on working. Uh, two were basically by mid-century had, had, had gone. In 1815, the, 1850, the state uh, uh, found a, a so-called modern hospital, Maris Khane, Maris Khane Daulati, the state hospital. Uh, but uh, uh, from the uh, description of an Austrian um, physician who was involved in that, he said it was an awful place where people um, uh, basically ran more the risk to get the disease than be healed. Um, the, the first real modern hospital was built in 1883 in Urmia, that is in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, by the American Presbyterian Church. It also housed the first medical school in Iran where people were, local people were trained uh, and uh, had to pass an exam which was equal to the exam that doctors in the United States had to pass. Um, the same uh, missionaries, American established hospital in Tabriz, Tehran, Rasht, Mashhad, Hamadan, Kerman Shah in Iraq. The British Church Missionary Society, the Anglicans, did the same in Isfahan, Yas, Kirman, and Shiraz. The British government of India established hospitals in Banner, Abbas, Bushir, etc. The oil company established the most modern hospital in the Middle East, in, in, in Ahwaz, uh, sorry, in Abadan, but there are two others in two other cities and a lot of dispensaries. There were also then, um, as, as of the early uh, 19th, 20th century, private uh, Iranians who started uh, in, uh, establishing small hospitals. Uh, by 1924, there are 35 hospitals of varying sizes from very small 10 beds to uh, say 100 beds um, with a, a, a total of 1400 beds, 40 or more dispensaries, 10 quarantine stations, and there were in the entire country 945 officially authorized physicians, both foreign and Iranian. That didn't mean that you necessarily had a Western education, by the way. Of its 223, that is one third, practice in Tehran. So that means, let's say, in the, at the Riyan at the time, 10 million inhabitants, of which 9 million lived in the rural areas, you can see that hospitals uh, had no impact whatsoever on the situation of pub uh, public health. Uh, but it was a good beginning. Next slide, please. In the Pahlavi period, you start in 1925, and then the Islamic Republic in 1979, the government built more hospitals. Uh, especially in the Pahlavis, of course, they were constrained by lack of funds and qualified staff. They had to, they had to, had to there was not a, a, a university as yet. Uh, doctors were uh, trained uh, uh, abroad, many of which, by the way, in Beirut, in the American um, uh, University. Uh, what also was new, it was something that was introduced by the Americans and the British uh, were nurses, which didn't exist before. The Americans also basically established the first nursing school uh, in Iran, and their experience and training methods were adopted by the Iranian government later. 
Interesting enough, also, as I said earlier, you know, we know that Iranians considered the hospitals as the house of death. Well, uh, although we have seen that there were um, a, a lot of hospitals in, in many uh, towns all over Iran, Iranians didn't like to come there. They, they still considered them a house of death. Uh, many people only come, came there when, when they were dying, in fact. Uh, also, uh, most Iranians, even as late as the 1950s, prefer traditional um, medicine to modern medicine. What made hospitals over time more attractive than um, it was surgery, because a surgery was uh, something that was not done. Uh, well, cutting off legs, etc., uh, that 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 was done. But let's say uh, uh, surgery or um, or um, section on even a died person uh, was uh, forbidden by Islamic law. And so that didn't exist. And therefore, slowly but certainly over the years, the number of, of people who uh, started to have faith in hospitals increased. And the more success they had, and they saw that, um, that uh, people got better, and particularly, for example, people with trachoma and, and other eye diseases, um, uh, which was were the effects were immediately visible, uh, made a, a, a major di a difference. Of course, uh, as I said, uh, even where hospitals were more ex accepted and the number in increased, in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, healthcare to the, the, the population, uh, it was still a, 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 a limited uh, a, a instrument. Um, uh, moreover, uh, the, the major public health problem in Iran was not that we people were ill, but it was lack of sanita sanitation and personal hygiene, which was often the cause of, of diseases. And uh, those two were, um, uh, the sanitation and personal hygiene, were uh, combated by uh, national campaigns of vaccination, of sanitation uh, and education. Um, uh, as of 1970s, the number of, of uh, hospitals increased. They were also better staffed, better financed. They were able um, to um, better service, service people. And um, uh, you could say, let's say at the moment, and that uh, has been true, let's say already since the 1970s, that Iran had a good medical infrastructure um, that uh, was able uh, and is able to take care of uh, all kinds of diseases from the most complicated to the, uh, to the most simple ones. Uh, uh, although, let's say, uh, modern Iranian hospitals are not among the top 10, although a few are among the, among, among the first thousand, uh, which is uh, understandable uh, because they come um, uh, from uh, a shorter history than the ones that had an, advant an advance on them. It is not, let's say, because the, um, the uh, physicians or uh, other medical staff working there are less well-trained. On the contrary, they're quite well, quite well trained. I mentioned here on the slide, for example, Dr. Sam uh, Mohamed Samei, who is the most celebrated uh, neurosurgeon in the world. Um, uh, he was even invited uh, by the Chinese to establish a neurosurgical clinic. They made $100 million available and gave him also the Chinese uh, uh, nationality. Uh, uh, and there are other uh, very well-known uh, Iranian physicians who as individuals, let's say, are on par with the best in the world. So, um, the, so summing up, uh, basically, let's say for the first 1300 years, we have only very uh, uh, superficial information on how uh, on 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 the hospitals, how they functioned, where they were, who worked in there, what was taught in there. Uh, we we do know that they were mostly only for foreign for people who were not of the local city but there were pilgrims or other visitors, uh, that people were scared of them. And it was only, let's say, as of the uh, late 19th century, when the Americans and later other Europeans introduced modern hospitals, 
that the basis was laid for the modern medical infrastructure uh, in, in Iran. And um, um, I think, let's say that, uh, although uh, I have never been a client of a medical hospital, what I've seen of them, they indeed look as modern as the hospitals of which I have been a client here in the United States uh, and in the Netherlands uh, as, uh, uh, and so uh, I think they are, uh, are uh, on par uh, with the rest and are indeed uh, in the year 1400. Um, the, the, the one thing I would like to mention as, a, as an aside that, um, uh, you know, usually the, we say history doesn't repeat itself. It's interesting that both in the sixth century and in the 19th century, 1300 years of difference, in both times, uh, hospitals were introduced by Christian churches. First, the Syriac um, Christian church and the other, the American Presbyterian church. So history uh, may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation, Dr. Floor. It was truly incredibly interesting and very well put together. Uh, if the audience would like to ask questions, please do so in the Zoom Q&A section. And while we wait for the audience to send those questions in, I can begin us with, uh, with some of my own questions. Throughout Iran's history, there has often been sort of animosity towards the West. Could you uh, more, could you go into a little more detail about that animosity in healthcare towards Western inventions and practices? Well, uh, you know, do, well, you have to see, let's say, what part of history, I mean, uh, uh, the an animosity towards the West, well, uh, let's say in the antiquity was, was not that well pronounced. In fact, the Iranians went out of the way to conquer the West at the time. But you're probably talking more, let's say about more modern times, let's say the 19th century when um, uh, medical science and let's say also the first really major contacts with the West were made, not only in terms of political, military, uh, uh, and, uh, and, sci and, and scientific, uh, but also in all other aspects, uh, let's say many travelers and Europeans visiting, as well as working in Iran. Uh, in, initially there was, let's say, you have to uh, be careful about that in the sense that um, uh, in Iran, ever since it had lost the war, two wars against um, uh, Russia in 1814 and 1828, there was um, the strong feeling that they say, look, we have to, we should not um, remain behind in terms of capabilities, military and otherwise with, with uh, the West, in particular Russia, um, but we should beat them at their own game. And so they sent uh, students to Europe to study various crafts. Um, uh, and that whole thing, I've written a book about it, you can read it more in detail, but it went in, th in certain waves. Um, that also went to, was accompanied by the uh, establishment of modern factories, for example, in, uh, to have uh, import substitution. Um, and also um, the, uh, the uh, 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 seduction, I would almost say, of the Western political system uh, was um, quite great among uh, the Persian intellectuals. One of the most important intellectuals who wrote a book, um, a very small pamphlet, in fact, uh, I remember correctly, about 1880 or so, um, had one title. And uh, 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 oh, I had made one message. And he said, what is it all about? What modernization? Kanun, the law. And because he said, you know, what, what, what makes the West strong 
and as weak is that they have a, a, a law that is applicable to everybody and is predictable. And, uh, and therefore it better regulates the in interaction between men internally and externally than the system that we have. And of course, the author tried to make that compatible with the principle of Islam, but uh, uh, so uh, they were very much uh, in favor of the Western ideas. You see it also reflected later on in um, the uh, uh, Constitution Revolution of, of between 1905 and 1907, where basically the first Iranian constitution was based on European principles. Uh, that doesn't mean that there were uh, groups in Iran, in particular on the religious, not all of them, by the way, um, uh, uh, many, in fact, in, uh, 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 supported the Constitutional Revolution, for example, um, uh, who uh, saw, let's say, the penetration of Western ideas as inimical to Islam, and, uh, in fact, as a threat. Um, when the new Pahlavi regime took over in 1925, uh, it, um, it didn't want, let's say, to westernize, but it wanted to take over the Western methods and Western means to modernize uh, in order to be not only, let's say, uh, bring Iran, uh, improve Iran's uh, economic and social position, but also be more secure against its neighbors. Uh, this this uh, whole discourse uh, uh, that took place um, basically was a little bit of a one-sided one, uh, top, top down, rather than, let's say, involving uh, a discussion with social society. And that is one of the reasons, there are many other reasons, I can refer you to a book about that, um, why in uh, 1977 the um, popular movement arose in Iran, which led in finally to the revolution in 1979, which by the way was not Islamic at all. I was there at the time, I was there in 77, 78, 79. Nobody ever said, you know, we want Islam or uh, uh, what they went in the street for was, was political freedom. Uh, it, it was for social housing, education for people. And, and then, nobody was ever, uh, let's say, stopped in practicing Islam under, under the Shah's uh, Thank you for that insight, Dr. Floor. Uh, we have a question from the audience that states, hi, Dr. Floor, you stated at the very beginning of your lecture that Khosro Anishirvan departed from the custom. What custom? Thank you. The custom of creating hospitals. I mean, Timothy, the uh, Archbishop of Ktesiphon, uh, who treated uh, uh, um, uh, Anushirwan, said, you know, here, he wrote to his friend, here is the, sh the Shah who uh, gave us this hospitals, attached 12 physicians to it, which, which was against custom. Nam namely, it did, hadn't happened before. That's what it means. And therefore, let's say the the uh, story which have now been shown to be erroneous, that it already happened for, uh, for 400, uh, yeah, 400 years earlier under Shahpur, uh, uh, makes it also clear that he said, you know, it's basically you could say uh, uh, as against custom, as it had happened never before. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment that says, there are records from Shahri Sukhti brain surgery, which took place in 2000 BC. During the British occupation of Iran and the two world wars, the British policy was very similar to that of India. The British played a role in the famine after the war, as well as other pandemics, such as the influenza. In modern history, tainted blood was brought in Iran by mistake from France, and that is how AIDS entered the country. Uh, do you have any comments on those comments? Okay, well, as far as the brain surgery, what he means is, um, uh, which is, was not only, let's say, done in, the, in Iran, it, we have uh, evidence for that in other uh, 
uh, uh, parts of the world as well, is that let's say when somebody had the brain tumor or something, that they brought a sort of drill, made a hole in the head and then tried to get out whatever there was in there. Uh, that was not only 2000 BC, uh, we even have um, uh, reports from the 1950s that it formed, happened among the Bakhtiari nomads, for example. Now, that is one thing. As far as the British is concerned, uh, I uh, disagree uh, with the comment. Um, the, um, well, if the reader, uh, if the commenter wants to read more about it, uh, I can refer them to um, uh, two books that I've written. One is on uh, the history of bread in Iran. And the other is, uh, what is it called? Uh, oh yeah, um, food security in Iran. What happened uh, when the British, in, uh, not the British and the Russians invaded in August 1941, Iran was already suffering from a drought. Now, clearly, if you have uh, uh, tens of thousands of foreign troops on your soil uh, and you have a drought, uh, you have a problem. Uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, it was, the, it, it was with the help from the Brits that the famine uh, the, uh, was um, uh, averted. In fact, the, the, the Brits imported, if I remember correctly, 200,000 tons of uh, grain from India. Uh, 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 the, um, the main problem was not so much the, the Brits, it was uh, the Iranians themselves. Uh, the Sh Reza Shah had gone, the firm regime that he had in place and the control that he had in place had disappeared. And uh, as a result, the landlords uh, started um, uh, making uh, tons of money by not uh, releasing their stock of grain in, into the market. Uh, I can even refer the author to a Persian book that, a book in Persian that was um, uh, um, uh, written, I think, two years, not four years ago. Uh, I can, if he is interested, I can send him uh, the, uh, the title, although it's footnoted in my book, where the uh, the, the author. Uh, shows, let's say, that much of the grain in Western Iran was smuggled uh, across the border into Iraq uh, uh, um, about the tainted blood. I don't know anything. Um, uh, I can only say, let's say, that the same um, uh, accusation, rumor, or how do you want to qualify it, was also um, uh, aired here in the United States and, and in other countries. So, uh, but I have I am not knowledgeable on that subject. Thank you, Dr. Flora, for that response. Uh, if y'all are in the audience and would like to ask a question, again, y'all can do so by submitting those questions in the Zoom Q and A. Uh, our next question, and you you commented. Uh, quite a bit on Iran's medical timeline vis-a-vis -vis other countries that had, or other parts of the world that sort of had a head start on that. Uh, was there a golden age of Iranian healthcare? No, there was not. Uh, look, basically, we've, uh, if there's a golden age, you would say, comparatively speaking, it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, look, not only in Iran, but let's say uh, certainly before the 19th century, uh, the world was a hell to live in, medically speaking. Uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, children uh, uh, died, most of them died before the age of five. And those who survived, yeah, they could live a long life. It was not for nothing that the average age until uh, say the 1850s, uh, even in Europe was, three, was 35 years. So uh, no, there was no there was no golden age. Sure, there were let's say golden moments in such that you had outstanding physicians, etc. But um, as I said, if you're one physician and you have ten million potential patients, it doesn't make a damn difference. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Our next question is actually another comment. It says there is plenty of evidence 
that shows international aid has been tied to foreign policy that is geared to the interest of the Western powers. In the case of Pakistan, for a very recent example, vaccination was tied to intelligence activities of the Americans. Do you have any response to that comment? I don't know. I don't work for the American government. Uh, uh, sure, let's say, uh, if people give money, not only Western governments, or if you or I give money to some uh, to something, you have certain intentions, call them political, call them social, whatever wise. And sure, let's say, if a government gives money to another uh, to uh, to another country, it wants to, that money to be spent in uh, the most effective way, and uh, and then it attaches certain conditions uh, to uh, that aid. Now you can you can argue whether those conditions, uh, even when they are uh, acted upon are uh, uh, guarantees for effective uh, application. That's a different matter. But you know, uh, in itself, uh, that is not so, uh, nothing uh, uh, nothing uh, strange about it. Uh, whether uh, they used, uh, to be honest, um, I would like to, uh, the, the, it's interesting, uh, I, for my own uh, interest, why, why would the United States want to gather uh, in, uh, 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 information from poor Pakistani villages? For what purpose? That doesn't, it strikes me rather odd. Thank you for that insight. Our next question, were hospitals run by missionaries successful in their goal of spreading Christianity throughout Iran or parts of Iran? The, sh the short answer is no. In the first place, um, they were forbidden to convert Muslims, although they did some, even some mullahs and some Sayyids, for example. Were, uh, their main target population were Syrian Christians, Armenians, and Jews. And even their, their, um, uh, their uh, uh, target, uh, let's say, uh, they, they didn't achieve the success that they hoped for. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, they had also competition. Uh, for example, the, the Americans who were started in Azerbaijan had competition from the Anglicans and the, uh, the Catholics, for example, and even the Russian Orthodox. So, uh, uh, so but the short answer is no. And, um, and, and the, uh, it's clear, Iran still is not Christian. So we, we have to wait. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have to see if that ever turns out. Uh, exactly. our, right. our next question is, are there still areas in Iran that look towards Western medicine with suspicion? Uh, yes, uh, like the United States. You should, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, many people here, the so-called anti-vaxxers or however you want to, who say, I don't want to take it because I don't know what's in it. Uh, uh, it's interesting. They also don't know when they take their vodka, what's in it, uh, but that doesn't stop them. So yes, I mean, there are always people who, for whatever reason, are opposed to uh, something, even when, um, they know what's in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what most surprised you during your research for this book? Oh dear. Uh, what most surprised me is was the utter lack of information on how hospitals actually function. You know, uh, before I started with it, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know uh, anything about hospitals. So that was the fun part about it. And, um, and then uh, you, well, you knew about, um, about uh, uh, I mean, I knew about the medical, uh, the medical science as it has developed in the 10th uh, and 11th century in Iran. So I also had this idea, well, you know, there is some interesting information available on, on, uh, on hospitals. 
Well, I first read a book by an Iranian author, uh, the, also called The History of, of Hospitals. Well, if you read that book, uh, then you see that 80% of the information is about individual physicians throughout the century who may or may not have actually ever worked in the hospital. Uh, sometimes he uh, just assumes that. Uh, and even if he could say that they worked, he didn't know what they actually were doing. For example, it was quite, even let's say, as late as the 1960s, we know that from various reports, that um, in a government hospital in, in, in Hamadan, let me give you an example, uh, um, was what had, had just been built, I think it was 65 or so. And um, the report that was written by an um, uh, inspection team said, well, it was not well run um, uh, and uh, because the doctors spend most of the time on their private practice. And that has to do, of course, with the financing, uh, the, uh, the, med the, infra the medical infrastructure in Iran in, in, in general. And that has changed uh, right now. For example, if you look at the modern uh, health care system in Iran, 50% of the hospitals are owned by the social security system, uh, to which most uh, all, yeah, all Iranians are entitled to. Um, so uh, it, 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 it shows you, let's say, that uh, things develop uh, and uh, which was, which, let's say, working as a private physician uh, was something that also happened in Europe in the, in the build up uh, to modern, uh, modern hospitals. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It was just something that happened. I mean, uh, you can look from with the eyes of 2022 and say it's wrong. It was a different world. Great, thank you. Our next question, did Black Death affect Iran? And is there any evidence of that? Black Death, oh yes. Uh, well, what I would suggest, um, I have written the book about, uh, uh, well, it's a book of various articles that I wrote about um, uh, the history of medical, uh, uh, the medical scene in Iran, where I discuss amongst other things the well, the first plague that we know of is from 600. Uh, and um, uh, that is called the, the, um, the Trajan plague after the emperor Trajanus. Uh, uh, I have listed all the plagues that uh, we, are, we know. The problem with the word plague is um, that, uh, which is a Greek word, um, uh, uh, um, that in Arabic, um, they uh, make a difference between uh, the, the, the plague and other, uh, and other uh, endemic diseases uh, initially, but the, um, uh, uh, in, during most centuries, the, um, the, the word uh, was mixed, for example, Baba and Ta'un, are the words. Uh, Ta'un is plague, Waba is cholera. But they usually say uh, in, in this year there was Waba wa Ta'un. Now, whether it was cholera and the plague or it was either one of them, you don't know. It is basically in the early, let's say up to 1000, they usually make that difference. It is only as of the uh, beginning of the 19th century that they again started making, making that difference. The plague, let's say, or the epidemics, I should say, that we know happened were some sort of devastating and emptied entire, uh, 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 well, uh, well, the figures are sometimes incredible. They say, for example, at the, about 1480, there were 1 million people in the city of Herat, Afghanistan, which of course is impossible. There were not even a million people in there, but it shows you, let's say, that it made a, an enormous impact and it was quite regular. 19th century in particular is interesting. You had a, a, a series of, of, of pandemic uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and endemic uh, diseases, especially cholera, in fact, seven waves, which you'll, and a way that brings me back to the influenza for the for earlier comment. The, 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 the problem is, let's say, that um, there is very little information about it. There is one report 
which I have published that was written by a British um, physician uh, um, and uh, which I have enhanced as uh, information about other. Uh, he uh, lists all the information that he received from British consuls and other sources of each town. And, um, and it shows you, let's say, that, that it was really bad. Uh, but he says, you know, you cannot extrapolate those figures to the whole of Iran because we don't have the information. It was also a very interesting. Iran was probably one of the countries that was most hit by, um, uh, by the disease, not only by the influenza, because um, the, uh, earlier in the year, you first had a typhus epidem epidemic that was followed by a malaria epidemic. Then you got the influenza epidemic. And then you have to realize before all that started, most people were in a bad health condition. So yes, it was literally a devastating year. According to official Iranian sources, 200,000 people died in 1918. Uh, there is uh, one scholar uh, who, uh, if I remember correctly, um, uh, using Dr. Nelligan's report, extrapolates this nevertheless to 1.2 to 2.8 million, which I wouldn't say is impossible, but uh, I mean, he could also as, as, as well say 3 million because you can't prove it or disprove it. Great, thank you. Our next question, how do you see the role of hospitals in the process of secularization in the Iranian society? Oh dear. Uh, well, well, that's a very good question. Uh, firstly, I, I don't think that hospitals have that role. It is, it, let's say, in, in, in one sense, they may have because they are a symptom of education. And I think it's only education that will lead, uh, not only education, but also the actual practice by the non-secular uh, people right now, uh, uh, you know, there, there is a saying in Iran that they say before the revolution, um, we prayed at home and drank uh, alcohol in a cafe. Now we drink alcohol at home and we pray in the mosques. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, and in fact, uh, during my visits, I noticed that the number of mosques since 1979 has increased enormously despite the uh, lack of housing for people and they are not very much frequented um, uh, although you know we see on on television that that they are it all depends uh, you have old let's say in old neighborhoods where uh, traditional neighborhoods where people uh, come together, but it's also a social occasion. It has nothing to do, um, or let's well, nothing to do with religion per se. So I don't think, let's say, that hospitals per se will play that role. It is a, it's it's a combination of factors. It's also let's say, um, history is like a pendulum. Now we're going this way, all the way to uh, to the religious side, and then we go to the irreligious side and uh, maybe the secular one is in the middle. Thank you. Uh, how was the research process for this book? Were most of your sources in Persian or other languages? And uh, oh, did you find it difficult? Uh, no, they were in many, uh, uh, many sources. Well, basically Persian and one of them Arabic, um, some in Turkish, uh, Italian, French, uh, English, I don't know. Uh, and English was, a, for the modern period, English was the most important one because let's say I have um, used the archives of the Presbyterian Church. I have read the all, have had all the reports uh, for, by, written by the doctors. Unfortunately, for example, if you take Rasht, very well uh, documented, Mashhad, very well documented, Tabriz, really badly documented, uh, Hamadan, well documented, Kermashah, well documented, 
Iraq, yani Sultan of Adwell documented, Tehran, uh, up to a certain point, it is, it, 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 it is uh, 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 um, uh, various. Unfortunately, I had no time uh, to go to uh, Birmingham, where the uh, archives are of the Church Missionary Society. I used uh, the uh, Brit British reports in which the summaries of these reports are to be found. So, um, uh, and the Br British consular reports with regard to um, the, British, uh, the British Indian government hospitals. And then, of course, the re reports from the oil company for the oil company. So, yeah, there's a, it's a large variety of, of, of sources, which is, let's say, <coughs> if you study in Iran, does it matter, the Iranian history, the, uh, irrespective of the subject, you need sometimes up to 10 different languages to be able to access the sources. Well, fortunately, your book can now bridge that gap hopefully for a lot of people um by by putting so many languages into one i think that about does it for today's spotlighting an author event thank you so much dr floor for being with us today uh, i encourage everyone in the audience to buy his book history of hospitals in iran 550 to 1950 it's published with mage publishers and you can buy it through their website uh, next week, this or next coming Friday, we have another spotlighting an author event. Uh, it's February 25th with Christopher Nelson. He'll be talking about his new book, Essential Voices, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora. Uh, if you found today's event interesting, please do check out our website at iran1400.org. There you can find a multitude of articles and videos published in both RC and English about Iran's institutions and ideas such as modernity, identity, education, women's rights, and so on. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom of our website, you can actually sign up for our newsletter with your email. And from there, we will keep you updated with all of our new articles, events, and podcasts and whatnot. Uh, you can also follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Iran 1400 podcast. And if you find today's event interesting and are specifically looking for more information about uh, medical history in Iran, please do check out our, our article written by Shide Rezai on our website called Iranian Success Story, the development of Iran's public health website. Uh, I'm sorry, the development of Iran's public health system on our website. Uh, again, thank you all for coming today. And Dr. Floor, again, thank you so much for your time and for your fascinating presentation and for going through all of these great questions with us. Uh, and that is it for today. Uh, thank you all again for coming out. Please do check out our website. I hope you all all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Goodbye.